Good morning. Welcome to the 2018 Sloan Sports Analytics Conference and the Bill James Room, presented by Action Network. My name is Philippe Panico. I'm a second year MBA student at MIT Sloan, and I'm the student lead for this panel, Nothing But Net, Present Value, Investing and Innovation in Sports. It's my honor today to be introducing our panelists. We have Jerry Cardinal, Managing Partner and CEO, Redbird Capital Partners. Wick Grosbeck, Managing Partner, Governor and CEO of the Boston Celtics. Josh Harris, Managing Partner at Harris Blitzer Sports and Entertainment. <laughs> Thank you. And Jonathan Kraft, President, the Kraft Group. <laughs> Our moderator today will be Saj Cherian, partner oh. at Kinetic. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. the panel will run for 40 minutes and we'll leave five minutes at the end for Q&A from the audience. Oh, if you'd like to ask a question, please tweet using the hashtag investing and <laughs> innovation and Saj will choose the best questions to ask our panelists. With that, I'll turn it over to Saj. Thanks, Philip. Uh, thrilled to be back here at MIT to moderate a discussion with our all-star panel of investors. Just like this past Sunday's NBA all-star game, our game will have four quarters. First quarter, what makes a great sports investor? We will ask our panel how they became some of the leading owners and investors in professional sports. Next up, what makes a great sports investment? After the half, what's the future of sports? Where's the smart money investing? And then we'll wrap up with the fourth quarter. Our panel will answer questions from you, the audience. So get ready. What makes a great sports investor? So I guess home court advantage is a toss up uh, between Jonathan and Wick. Uh, but I'm going to start with Jonathan. As president of the Kraft Group, you oversee a number of businesses from the Patriots and private equity to paper and packaging. What sparked your interest in sports? How did it influence the way you run your sports businesses? Um, as, I'll try to be succinct, but growing up, uh, I had three younger brothers, and um, we all loved sports. None of us, led by me, were great athletes. Uh, but my father, in 1971, bought season tickets to the Patriots, who were that year moving into Schaefer Stadium. And uh, we all bonded over that shared experience and, and would go to the games. And I think um, when we did it, we just, we built a bond as brothers and a father that didn't exist in anything else that went on in, in our daily lives. It was just a special part of our childhood. Um, we never thought about it as a business in those days. I think people could never dream of owning a sports team, but uh, our, when I got into my 20s and my dad had been a little bit more successful and made some income, our core businesses were in manufacturing. And when the opportunity came about to buy the Patriots, and we had been going, we had continued to go for all those years. And as you get older and you get into business, you start to look at things a little more critically. And I think we had a passion for the Patriots and for NFL football, and we'd watch games in other markets when we would travel. And we just saw things that we would like to do differently. Like you'd like to own the team you feel passionate about. And I think that's the most important thing. But then the second thing is, making sure you take your business disciplines from wherever else you've been and use whatever skills you may or may not have to try to improve uh, the sports asset. And I, it just married a passion with an interest in business and the timing was right. And for us, it was in our hometown, which made it very special. Got it. So, uh, so Wick, you actually were a, a collegiate athlete. You won a national rowing championship as part of Princeton's 1983 uh, lightweight crew team. Seems yeah. like 1883, actually, but yeah. yeah. So how did you get from uh, Lake Carnegie to the Garden? <laughs> um, well, let's see. I'm not supposed to. Uh, my wife finds me every time I brag about the past. So here's five bucks more. I'll pay the, the kitty. Thanks. But um, um, that that feeling of uh, I felt like I was my best self when I was competing on a team at a high level, 
and it was all about the team. It wasn't, I'm, I wasn't good enough to win individually, but together we did something special. And so I love that feeling. I was 41 years old sitting in my, at my desk at a job, uh, uh, a great job, but I, I felt like there was more uh, that I could get out of myself in life. And then I remembered those days of rowing and I um, watched the Red Sox get sold to a great investment, great ownership group in 2001. And I said, you know, what about these other Boston teams? And I zeroed in on the Celtics and thought about what if I could become part of a great franchise, much bigger than myself, you know, a, a team that was founded by legends and, and uh, has such an iconic tradition in history. And what if I could take care of the Celtics in a way? Not really own the Celtics, but take care of them. And, and so that feeling reminded me of being part of this team back in the day. And so I went after it with some great partners and uh, we were able to get control of the Celtics and have had them for 15 years. It's been a great honor. So Jerry, you also were a member of a national champion lightweight crew team. Uh, at Harvard, and then you rode later. We never rode against one another. It would be, it would have been bloody. <laughs> you, you later rode at Oxford. Now I rode at Oxford. Now I just want to be clear for the audience. I rode at Oxford, not for Oxford. Uh, so, uh, so I know the tradition, right, is for the losing crew to hand over their shirts, their jerseys, to the victors. So my question for you is: It's true that you have more Princeton jerseys than Wick has Harvard jerseys? Yeah, well, you know, uh, that's a sore subject between, we're still trying to figure that out, but in rowing, uh, you, at the end of the race, you pull the boats together and the losing crew takes their shirt off and gives it to the, the, their opposite person in the winning crew. So Wick and I would always go back and forth, most recently wondering how many Princeton shirts I have and how many Harvard shirts you, you have. You don't have any of mine, I know that. <laughs> and I don't have any of yours. But. Exactly. So, but, but Jerry, you made a different play, right? You yeah. uh, founded your own investment firm. How did you get in the game of investing in sports? You know, luck's a great thing. Um, I, I started my career uh, close to 25 years ago at Goldman Sachs uh, and, really, and started in China. So I opened up their offices in Hong Kong and Singapore, uh, which took me out of the game in terms of all this kind of stuff until I came back to the States in uh, the late 90s. And you know, when you, when you come back to Goldman after being abroad, you're scrambling to find a niche for yourself. And what was ironic, it's ironic in hindsight, uh, but the only niche that was open for someone to go monetize or develop uh, were families and family business owners, which you know today is sort of old news, but back then uh, no one had really been paying attention to any of these families. I mean, Goldman is very much a corporate-driven place. Uh, and one family that approached us, I was in the private equity business at Goldman, one family that approached us owned a baseball team in New York, uh, and they had just broken away from another family in New York who carried their games on MSG. Uh, so obviously that was the Steinbrenner family who approached us. And you know, my start in sports um, was really apprenticing with George Steinbrenner. Uh, you know, he, had a, he had a theory back then, this is the late 90s, and that's why he put the Yankees and a basketball team, the New Jersey Nets at the time, together. Uh, the idea was by doing that he could create the basis for year-round programming, content, uh, and then he said, well, why are we allowing someone to come in between us and our fan in terms of the monetization of that content? Why, why can't we do that directly? Uh, and the answer obviously was, well, we have no idea how to build a cable channel. So they came to us and it was, wasn't as much about the money. The money was important because no one, at that time, we wrote a $335 million check to buy 40% of the intellectual property of the New York Yankees and the New Jersey Nets. But, um, and to keep that in context, particularly with Josh, who $335 million check today in private equity is, you know, it's, it's ho-hum. Back then, that was one of the largest private equity checks written. Uh, and we announced that deal uh, on September 10th, 2001. Uh, and we were expecting a, a great press conference the next morning to talk about it. And by the end of the week, um, we were thinking about bringing someone else in to partner with us. And by the end of the week, um, we couldn't get down to Midtown, uh, get down to town, obviously, so we were holed up in lawyer offices in Midtown, and um, we backstopped the entire thing and, and started to think about how do we build this network, in the, and particularly in the light of what just happened in 9-11. Um, so the answer to the question is, you know, I, my entry into sports was what has carried through to me today, which is not necessarily buying a team, uh, but finding ways to partner with rights holders and team owners and help them build businesses with terminal value around the economics of those teams. And that all started in with George Steinbrenner. Got it. 
Josh, you also were a collegiate athlete. You wrestled for Penn. Uh, how did that experience shape your desire to go back to Philadelphia and, and actually own a team? Yeah, look, um, you know, I always loved sports, and for wrestling is the kind of sport where um, if you don't prepare and you don't um, get ready for it and run and lift and do all the things you need to do, you get physically dominated, and so it really taught me about life. And um, once I started to wrestle, I started to do better in school, and so it really helped lift me um, as a person, as an individual. And, and then, obviously, when I went to Penn, it was uh, the last year that the uh, Philadelphia Savage Sixers had uh, won the NBA title. It was the faux 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 year. Dr. J, uh, Maurice Cheeks, Moses Malone, Andrew Tony, and so it was a really exciting year for the Sixers. And so, um, you know, when I, um, <clears throat> you know, after Apollo went public, um, I um, started to look at the Sixers. I'd heard that, um, you know, Comcast might be interested in selling, and I approached them, and uh, you know, was able to acquire the Sixers, uh, which I'd always dreamed about. And so. Um, I would say that um, you know owning a sports team, you know, really is um, the triple play. You um, you know you get to have you know we've all been we've all been college athletes, many of us have been high school athletes, but being around the the best players in the world at, at any given thing is really uh, it's it's just fun. Uh, and you know as you, obviously you lose the ability to compete at a very high level as you get older, and but yet you feel like you're competing, so you get that as a vehicle. Plus, um, sports is um, a good sports is a good investment. Um, you know, so you not only do you have fun, but I sort of saw it as a way um, to, to you know to, to make money and earn return. And then lastly, um, there's really it's really exciting to um, you know identify with and steward you know franchise for a city. Uh, and you know, there's nothing like sports to uh, draw people in, and particularly kids. And once you get them in, um, you can help them. You know, do you know through other means, through educating them, and you know some of um, certainly some of the teams that we're involved with are come from very tough places. But for me, it was very emotional. It's much more emotional than financial. But there is a, you know, what we've all seen. Um, luckily, is that uh, the financial side works as well. That's great. So as this is the Sloan Sports Analytics Conference, I want to turn to the data and metrics of investing. Uh, Wick, when you set the bid for the Celtics in 2002, what data did you use to make your decision? <clears throat> it took me about 30 minutes to decide. I, I, I had to find the owner. I had to go down and see him uh, off-site down in New York. That's where he lived. He hadn't been to Boston for a number of years. Um, and he mentioned a number, and he thought it was a very high number, and he was right. And um, I went back, sort of looked, I pulled the public filings on the company. It was a publicly traded company at the time, Boston Celtics LP. And um, I saw they were making, the, the number was 375 million. And uh, I saw that they were making 20 million of cash flow a year. And so it was a very high multiple by any, anybody's calculations. But I thought of it not as an investment of money I thought of it as an investment in a passion, a love of my life, a something that would I'd spend my life doing. Uh, it felt like a calling in a way, and um, I'd be paid in a sense in enjoyment. And my partners and I imagine if we were able to take the Celtics back and get another banner, and ride in a parade, and do all the things in the community. It just felt like money was secondary, and I'm not made of money in any way. I'm a an uh, average guy in that way, and certainly was at that time. Um, been very, very, very lucky, but, but um, anyway, not, not a mega person in, in terms of money. And so, but still I was able, I don't mean to boast about it, but just put the money a little bit aside. So uh, the reason these teams trade for this amount of uh, money even today is that it's, it's not in comparison <laughs> to buying a factory or a software company or a, some other business. It's, it's, it's the way that if you were competitive and you're a team player and you know, you're on the world stage and you're trying to win a championship and you're trying to do great things and set examples of inclus inclusiveness and uh, tolerance and equality uh, worldwide, you know, it's a great thing that you're part of. And, you you um, can't use that same investing approach for your other day job, right, at yeah, Causeway. That's right, and Causeway, we're passionate about, uh, we've just raised our second fund and we invest in sports tech and media businesses and it, it is very much uh, bottom line oriented, but it's playing off the fact that sports excites passions among fans and participants and uh, owners. And so 
then there is money to be made as well. And Jonathan, you've built a culture of data at the Patriots, uh, so much so that you actually uh, launched uh, the Craft Analytics Group um, to, um, as a separate company uh, to help other teams and, and, better, uh, and, and other businesses uh, actually leverage the power of their data. Can you talk about uh, your decision to invest in Kager and then um, how you think the business of sports analytics, where it's headed? Well, we were, we're business people, and Jessica Gelman, who's the co-founder of this conference, um, um, she and I had talked now probably 11, 12 years ago just about more formalizing a process. I think we were always looking at data, but not in an organized, coherent fashion. The technology uh, didn't exist in those days. We, we had like 14 different databases that existed across our businesses. They, there was a lot of redundancy. They weren't dynamic. Technology didn't let you do that. But we, we had a little bit of a perception of where the world was going, and we felt that if we could start to get smarter about how people were interacting with our business, whether they were ticket holders or were just consumers of our content, we would be in a better position to give them better experiences and by default and better options and by default generate more income. So that's how it happened. And then Jessica really ran with it. And you know, starting about four or five or I guess six years ago, she started getting lots of phone calls all the time from people just saying, hey, we hear the Patriots um, are doing some things in this space. Can you help us? We'd like to do it too. And after a while, we are business people. And I was like, Jessica, this isn't like the conference. We're not in the not-for-profit business. So we should probably um, we should probably take your expertise and the team of people she had built up within our organization and, and spin them out into their own business. So that's how. Including from us, by the way. Yeah, the, yeah you, the, <coughs> Josh at, at Harris Blitzer and the Sixers and the Devils were our first real outside uh, paying customer. And so thank you. You, you another way you led the way. But um, that's how we got into the business. And I think. I, you know, the term analytics is so, I worked at Bain for a while, and one of Wix's partners, Paul Edgerly, who I saw here today, was my first boss there. And we were using analytics then, but it was analytics around just common sense. Look at data. Before you make decisions in any business, whether it's sports or you're making widgets in a factory, you know, if you don't have information and aren't using it intelligently, you're, you're, you're not going to be maximizing whatever the opportunity is for you. And I think when people used to invest in sports, a lot of times it was as a passion and, and a hobby and wanting to be around the greatest athletes in the world, as Josh talked about. But given the prices that are getting paid today and the fact that I think the fans of your team want to see these businesses run as businesses and know you're well stewarded, like any business you're in, if you're not using the data that's available to you and analyzing it in ways that can give you a competitive advantage, you're not, you're not doing a good job as a steward of a business. Josh, um, Jonathan gave you props for, for using Kager. The Sixers were named to Fast Company's um, most innovative companies list uh, just this past week. And it was, uh, I think the Sixers were the only uh, professional sports team actually on any of those uh, fast company lists. So, you know, my question is, what are the Sixers doing differently? Uh, what investments are you making in technology and data uh, that uh, you can leverage at the Sixers, both on the court and off? Yeah, first of all, shout out to Scott O'Neill and the team for doing that. Great job. Um, Look, I mean, I think what, what it starts with people. So I think that, I, you know, you really, um, whether it be, you know, my day job is uh, private equity alternative investments. But like, you know, obviously, even in, in, in any sports business, you know, having you win with the best people. Um, it's, it's, you know, certainly players, you win with the best players, but you win with the best, you know, business people, the best front office. And so really, it, like creating a culture that attracts you know, dynamic, young, um, and old um, people that are, you know, ready to come to work and have a vision and a mission. Um, I think that's really where it starts, uh, and 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 to a large extent is a big part of the success. In terms of specific, um, you know, uh, analytics and other things, like we're we're very much look the the advancements in big data are huge, and 
If you can figure out how to stop, cure cancer, uh, in many cases, you can figure out, you can use that, se those, those, that same competing power to both affect your business in a positive way uh, and affect your on court, on field, on ice, you know, on pitch performance. And we're doing all of that. Um, and, you know, certainly, um, you know, the Kraft Group and Jessica, you know, in terms of understanding who our uh, season ticket holders are, what they want to buy, um, you know, what they're interested in, and collecting data from all the phones that are all over the place and uh, understanding them as people, uh, you know, that, that's a big part of what we're doing. Um, we're now looking at, you know, how quickly we can serve people in line and how we can dispel lines. So it's, it's also about, like, you know, uh, driveway to driveway experience. I mean, you know, the, the TVs are so good right now, the video, the ability to watch games on your phones. You know, you got to extract people into the venues. And so that's a big part of what we're doing um, on the business side is like trying to affect the in arena uh, experience. In terms of the sports side, I mean, obviously there's sport, sports science. You know, all of us up here understand that injuries are a big part and a big factor of like how your team plays. And so rehab, prehab, you know, kind of how you treat injuries. Like we put a ton of time into it. We've had a lot of issues um, that we've had to deal with and you learn by the school of hard knocks um, you know and then and then obviously analytics in terms of player selection um, and um, <clears throat> studying like you know what what traits correlate with good players um, you know and they're not they're not always obvious uh, and it's very hard to select good players that's a really important and then you know a lot of even m all of our coaching staffs you know are now looking at okay what configurations actually work you know, it wasn't that long ago that people were shooting, uh, and, and, you know, these guys are some of the leaders of, in this, you know, sitting with me, but it wasn't that long ago in basketball that people were shooting long two-point shots. And then someone figured out, it seems obvious now, right? Like, hey, wait a second, that doesn't make any sense. Shoot a three-point shot. Uh, and literally, that's changed the game. I mean, now you have um, you know, Steph Curry's of the world and, the, you know, the fast, you know, shooters, the wings. Um, dominating the game, um, you, know, for the, you know, for the most part, although we're trying to change that and take a little different approach. So um, all this stuff, uh, you know, the people that say, yeah, you know, this is like, you know, it doesn't work, are, are sort of becoming, you know, a little bit more narrow because at the end of the day, um, you know, it does work and uh, you really have to embrace it and try to create an edge. You know, there are 30, in our leagues, there are 30 people or 20 people in the case of the Premier League football that want to win. Uh, they all want to win a championship, right? So creating these, these edges over time is how you do win. So let's talk about building sports platforms. Uh, Jerry, you've been part of not just one, but two businesses built around the Yankees and the Cowboys, uh, the Yes Network and Legends. Um, how has that influenced your approach um, as you're making future sports investments? Yeah, you know, um, I'd say the, the template that we stumbled upon with the Yes Network uh, back in 2001 is still the template that I'm using today. So, uh, um, you know, uh, what's interesting is that that template seems to have taken me to every five years. And what I'm trying to do is figure out how to do more of this kind of investing and not have to wait every five years to do it. So mm -hmm. <laughs> five years after we did, uh, a little bit more than five years after we <clears throat> did the S yes Network, we put Legends Hospitality together. And, the, and that was out of a conversation with Jerry Jones. Uh, he and I were, I say, I say this euphemistically, stuck on a boat together for about 10 days. And, you know, we were, we were just comparing notes. He had just been, he got involved in the M NFL broadcast situation, trying to figure out how to create the NFL network, and said to me, how did you do yes? And so basically spent the first part of the, the boat ride do, giving him a tutorial on yes. And then at the end of it, um, he, he said, well, w we should do something together. What could we do? And there's always, you know, the, the, the constrictions around the leagues uh, and what you can and can't do. Uh, Jerry's always been pushing the envelope on that. Um, and I said to him two things. One, I said, you know what I would really love to do, and I would leave Goldman Sachs for this, is I'd love to merge the Yankees, the Cowboys, and the Lakers. Um, because I think if you did that, you'd have Disney overnight. I wouldn't watch any of those games. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, again, I, I, co I come at it from the, sports, from the uh, business side of it, and I said, you know, as a business proposition, you'd have a multinational global entertainment company. Uh, and so once we got past the happy talk uh, and all the reasons why that, you know, that was not going to be possible, I said, well, look, let, you know, you can make anything happen with the Cowboys. I'm on the board of the Yankees. I can, you know, try to deliver that. Compare notes. What are you doing? And we just both figured out that in 2009, they were both going to be debuting these state-of-the-art facilities, you know, what is now AT&T Stadium and the new Yankee Stadium. 
And so I said, look, why don't we, um, it, all we did in the, with the Yes Networks, we found a way to uh, capture the intellectual property of the Yankees and put a multiple on it, right? So I said, why don't we find a way to capture the intellectual property of these two stadiums and put a multiple on it, which is a fancy way of saying, you know, create a business that monetizes the fan as they come in and out of that stadium uh, and do it in a way that's consistent with the brands and helps the owners of these rights own their fan base better. You know, funny thing I always found about sports because I, you know, I don't own sports teams personally, so I look at it a little more unemotionally. I think sometimes it's the only industry um, that is a B2C, very much a, it's a B2B and a B2C industry. It's the only industry that for some reason that allows so all these middlemen to come between them and their fan. They don't own their customer the way, you know, if you were General Electric, you know, the way Jack Welch used to talk about owning their customer. Uh, and so that's, that's really the answer to the question, which is, you know, we debuted Legends, for, and, you know, again, in terms of the types of investing, if you look at Yes and you look at Legends, both were, both were startups. But the interesting thing about that is because of the rights holders that you were partnered with, you know, that, for, that Yes network, the first year out was 50 million of free cash flow. Uh, today it's around 400. Legends was 25 million of free cash flow, first year out. Uh, so, yeah, they're, they're startups, but, you know, the great thing about it is that because of the partnership that you have with the rights holder, it's all about the rights holder. Um, there are a thousand guys like me, but the rights holders are so unique. Um, you know, we're able to create these embedded in the money options around these rights holdings that have terminal value. So all the startup uh, entrepreneurs in the audience, find a team uh, to, uh, to attach yourself to, right? Is that or or, or an, an, ownership, an owner or ownership that is like-minded like that. Got it. So. so Josh, there's been a lot of talk in these halls uh, about uh, trust the process. What, uh, give us the real scoop. What, is, what, what does the process mean to you? Were you always thinking about building a sports and entertainment uh, platform around the Sixers, or did it just sort of evolve organically? Well, when we bought the Sixers, um, we, um, we went into it thinking that we wanted to deliver a championship to Philly, um, and it hadn't happened since 1982 uh, in basketball, and so on the sports side, we. Um, we looked at, you know, you can build teams through a number of ways, through the free agency, through the draft, and through trades. And so we, um, we, we ultimately um, decided that from, from, from our point of view that we wanted to build a culture um, and a team that uh, step by step over the long run. And I think as, you know, probably everyone knows, but just to put it in context, like every year, you know, the way you win in basketball is you have to have great players. Uh, it starts with a great organization where you have to have great players. And so we literally build, you know, but in every, and every year it take, you get a player, you get a draft pick. And great players tr tr typically attract other great players. And so, um, you know, we, we didn't have a stable of those. The Sixers had been in the midst, stuck in the middle for a long time. And so we decided we were going to literally start over, um, build a culture, and, and build piece by piece through the draft um, primarily. And that's what we did. And so. The process was about, um, you know, setting it up, uh, beginning and building step by step on the on the sports side, uh, and you know we're having some success. It's very exciting. Uh, you know we're seven, in seventh place, which so we look we're looking forward and hopeful to make the playoffs. And then, you know, we we this this fellow on my right. Actually, the, the last time we made the playoffs, we lost to them in the Eastern Conference Championship. So um, you know, in any case, like that, I'd, for, I'd forgotten. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, so any predictions? <laughs> these guys, these guys, you got to watch out for the Sixers. They're on yeah. their way. Yeah, I mean, we have, we have a, a lot of great players and uh, Joel and Ben and everything else. So I think, um, you know, in terms of the Sixers, that's how it started. In terms of the uh, business side of sports, um, you know, I, I, unlike Wick, we had a 17-month corporate carve-out. You know, I, I, I've taken a page out of my day job. Literally, we, the Sixers were part of the Flyer, Comcast, which is the Flyers, the media, the cable network and the stadium. So 17 months later, we had signed, you know, hundreds of intercompany agreements where we literally ring fenced the fix Sixers, and um, that took a long time. And so that, but we were enjoying it so much that, um, you know, and it was, you know, pretty much in, um, you know, just after the recovery of the financial crisis, and we really saw this sort of like tailwind in sports, which was. Um, the globalization of media, all of a sudden, you know, people are watching um, NHL hockey, NBA basketball, um, uh, Premier League soccer, so, you know, a British sport, um, obviously, uh, Major League Baseball, um, you know, 
they're watching it in China or uh, all over the, you know, in, in many, many countries. And so in some cases, there are more people in China watching our games um, than, than in some cases in Philly. So I think, um, you know, there was this tailwind there, and then, there was all, and then increasingly there was, this, there was a tailwind of the digitization of content. Like, all of a sudden, people can watch the content wherever they want. And so um, the businesses are becoming media businesses. So we saw this tailwind. We were loving uh, and enjoying sports. Uh, and so the um, banks, uh, the Devils were this storied franchise, uh, and the banks were on the doorstep uh, because they had built this you know, great stadium in Newark, the Prudential Center. And we uh, were able to pay off the banks and literally you know, just acquire the Devils in that way because they had spent too much on the stadium. Um, and so, uh, and, and, and then we, um, you know, we acquired uh, Crystal Palace in the Premier League with the same partnership group. And, um, and, and what we decided to do is to um, you know, put all the uh, uh, teams on the business side together, although Crystal Palace still remains outside uh, as an affiliation. Uh, and, and that was really done, yeah, so that was really done because Again, back to, you know, if you have a bigger platform, you can attract great talent. Um, and there are synergies across the different uh, companies, certainly on the cost side, uh, and certainly uh, on the sponsorship side. But I think, you know, ultimately it's about the people. So the vision of the Sixers uh, and the vision of HBSC evolved, uh, you know, but really had to do with, um, you know, the, the trends that were going on in sports and um, our ability to link everything together. Um, and attract really the best people to our team. So Jonathan, you also have a sports platform. You own NFL and MLS franchises, among others. If you had to invest in a sport that you don't own, uh, where would you put your money? G give us some insight on, on how you think about other sports. I, look, clearly the NBA of all the sports leagues has an amazing opportunity from an international perspective and the global globalization of media as Josh talked about. So I think that, you know, is it has unlimited upside and we're not in uh, the NBA. Um, I think the most, if I could go off of franchises for a minute, I think the most interesting uh, technology that exists out there today that I think will come and be a big part of sports is AR. People talk a lot about VR, but I really believe that AR is something that uh, over the next five years you're going to see get put to work in venues in way to enhance the experience of, of going to a venue, not only navigating the venue, but actually watching the game on the field, the pitch, the ice, as Josh talked about. But the, even then, outside of the venue, I think AR is going to help you engage in sports in ways that isn't that full virtual reality experience, which I actually think people don't want. I think the beauty of AR is it can enhance the real world experience of sports, whether you're in venue or out. So I would actually tell people to look at doing that. And if they wanted to get into a league that we're not in, I guess I would, I would say uh, the, the NBA, but I love the two leagues we're in, and obviously eSports is a huge phenomenon right now too. So let's, let's talk about AR just for a second. Um, I think one of the more interesting devices that come out of uh, last month's uh, CES were these Vuzix uh, Blade augmented reality glasses. I don't know if you guys have seen this. These were these like super sleek goggles. They had uh, Amazon's <coughs> Alexa voice assistant integrated in. So all of a sudden, it makes AR that much more approachable, you know, to the sports fan, kind of far more than, than Google Glass ever ever did, um, you know. So I guess, um, you know, Wick, Jonathan seems to suggest that AR is ready for prime time. Are, are you ex as excited about? About to be ready. About for to prime. be ready for prime time. Uh, yeah, we're we are building it into our Celtics app. We are going to have it at our games uh, to enhance for the second screen viewing even when you're in the seats uh, with stats and, and data, we're working on that. It, it, we're not rolling it out yet. Um, and some of the games, we don't really want to show the data because we lose, but uh, we'll do it anyway. <laughs> um, it's a, uh, something I believe, I believe more in AR than VR, but I'm not a, I mean, I was a history major. I'm not a, a forward tech thinker. I'm not giving TED Talks on technology. <laughs> Um, except for today, actually, now that I have a microphone, let me tell you my <laughs> thoughts on technology. Mm -hmm. But I, I am a, I'm a believer in AR. I think it's going to add a lot, um, but I still love sort of the old school being in the seat or 
you know, sort of being right there and just soaking it all in. Uh, but augmenting that uh, in an appropriate way uh, can add something to it, and I'm sure it will be a bigger part of our future. Okay, so I have two fans of AR. Jerry, where are you on this AR versus VR debate? I, look, I agree wholeheartedly with uh, what Jonathan and Wick said on the AR front. When you talk about VR, uh, you really got to start to define what you mean by VR. Um, I, in order for me to figure it out, uh, I made a personal investment. It wasn't right for Redbird, but I made a personal investment in a location-based virtual reality company called The Void. Uh, and very early in our existence, we were lucky and, and cut a very ex expansive deal with Disney, where we are now their partner uh, in a location-based virtual reality programming. Uh, we have sites in Anaheim, two in Orlando and one in London. Uh, and, you know, I'd say we're, in, we're not even out of the first inning yet and the um, attraction and the people that are coming to this and the, re and the feedback has been phenomenal. Uh, and it's all gonna come down to, not surprisingly, just like these devices, it's all gonna come down to taking the computer, you know, you basically strap a computer onto your back and like the movie The Matrix, you transport your, you know, it's location-based, meaning that they create a set, but the set is, frankly, cinder blocks. It doesn't cost much to create the set. What's the technology is all the cameras that they have there, and you put the gear on and with the backpack, which is just a, a microprocessor, and that thing's gonna keep getting smaller and smaller. The first one was really heavy. And you're literally like the Matrix transported into the game. Uh, and in this case, you know, a Star Wars movie. Uh, and it's phenomenal. And, and of course, I keep going back to the same model, which is, you know, to have the great content partner or rights holder makes everything. Obviously, we had to do our job on the technology side. So, so that's my, from a virtual reality standpoint, what we're hearing from some of the big guys is that people don't necessarily want to do VR in the home. Right. Um, but they'll go, you know, so one of the things we're thinking about, given our work we're doing with the NFL on, our, on their on-location business is at the Super Bowl, you could carve out, this is not as a 1,500 square foot type of a, you know, uh, series of mazes, if you will, that you go through when you transport yourself into this thing, and you could do that at a Super Bowl, as an example, uh, and, you know, start to combine that maybe with a little bit of AR. That could be really interesting. So that's, that's where I'm at. Got it. And Jonathan, you mentioned uh, esports, uh, so uh, let's, let's talk a little bit about that. The data is, is pretty compelling, right? Uh, more than two uh, times as many people watched the League of Legends World Championships uh, final. That was about 43 million viewers. Uh, then the final game of the NBA championships, uh, which was about 20.4 million viewers. And that was the most watched, uh, this last finals was the most watched since 1988. And then the average viewer, uh, the latest data is, is saying, uh, is consuming 20 plus hours of esports content a week. So data seems pretty compelling. Um, Jonathan, you own an Overwatch uh, esports team. You know, what metrics do you look at to know that esports is, 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 is gonna be a smart investment? Well, I, th I think we saw the fan engagement types of numbers you talked about. I think much like with all the sports that we're all involved with today, the fan bases were there before the full-blown monetization of them was there. And I think the most important thing you want to see is that there is an engaged audience that feels connected to the, to the sport and um, we chose Overwatch strictly because the game had just been launched. There were a lot of players globally quickly and Activision Blizzard as a parent company, the, the creators of the game really were, we liked the idea of them structuring a top-down league rather than the rest of eSports, which has really grown grassroots up. So from a business standpoint, we just felt that this top-down concept that Bobby Kotick and the Activision people had for Overwatch was the right way for us to get into the game because if you bought an endemic team that was sitting in a warehouse somewhere and playing, you know, fielding teams in two or three sports, the business model for that was too uncertain going forward. Um, so we liked that the audience was there, and like with other sports, we figured if the audience is there and you've got smart business people at the top and Activision Blizzard, the monetization and the ultimate form of the business would follow, and that's why we did it. Uh, Jerry, are you long or short on esports? Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely swimming against the tide on that one. I've, I've it, you know, I, I, um, I find it's hard for me to see an entry point that fits with the model that's worked so well for me over the last 25 years. So, um, you know, I, 
I'm, a, I'm an owner of Activision stock personally, so I subscribe to that, the, Jonathan's point. It's a good way to play it. Yeah, exactly. Um, but I, I don't, I, you know, I just, it, to me it's still too uncertain for me to figure out, if I look at the value chain in eSports, where I can invest with the kind of risk-adjusted profile that I would expect in some of these things. And it's, so I'm, I'm definitely on the sidelines. It's, it's an emerging field. I mean, we obviously you know, own, own Dignitas, which, uh, which plays a number of games. And the reality is it's a, it's a different model in terms of having uh, in these leagues, right, the teams on the leagues. In this case, you, know, you have uh, a publisher, but it doesn't mean that a public, you can't work it out with them in terms of having a business model. But I think it's an evolving business model. But I think to, to Jonathan's point, the fan engagement is such that um, you know, I think you have to look hard at how you play in the in esports um, and even beyond teams, right? Like, there's a whole ecosystem of social media, of apparel, of a whole bunch of other things around esports. And so, um, I think that it's an emerging area. Whether you know, none of the esports businesses are are profitable at this point. All of them lose mo money. All of them are venture funded or funded just through cash flow from somewhere else. Uh, but at the same time, the, the audience potential creates, you know, a, a willingness of people to invest. And so that's what's going on. Yeah. Well, I mean, this obviously is, you know, eSports is, is sort of this, this new form of content. But sports, at the end of the day, is always content, right? And as I learned from my, my days at NBC Universal, content is king. Uh, you know, Wick, as you think about the changing patterns of consumption, of media consumption, is that changing your investment thesis? Is that changing the way you're, you're making sports investments? It makes me more bullish. That's why we started Causeway, was to put more money to work in the idea of acquiring content, live content in sports, fundamentally, and one of the ideas. And uh, the more pipes there are, and the more the world uh, is opened up globally uh, to consuming the content, as was said before, uh, the more valuable the content becomes, the best content. And so we've been very fortunate you know, I may have overpaid for the Celtics in 2002 and sort of got bailed out by a media boom, but I, I, I like to think uh, that I felt that there was enduring value in a team, a great Boston team, in a great league run, um, you know, with, with superstar players, and it was a great game. But, you know, I didn't see, I did not foresee these media rights, but I think going forward, the people who will be bidding for the rights, uh, the NBA, NFL, um, eSports, you know, the market caps of the people who could bid in the future dwarf the current partners of the league, in a sense. And uh, it's all opening up. I, I'm actually extremely bullish on um, sort of the underpinnings of this whole sports um, thing. It's been going for thousands of years. There's a reason that so many of us like to compete and like to watch others compete. And uh, I'm, I'm a, I'm a long-term bull. Increasingly, people want to watch sports. They want to watch what they want to watch, when they want to watch it, where they want to watch it, right? So. Increasingly, you know, people are not watching it on TV. They're watching it on their iPhones. They're watching it on their iPads. They're watching it wherever they want to watch it, when they want to watch it. And so, therefore, um, there is going to be a business opportunity in terms of, you know, moving the delivery of content from the traditional cable channels to all of these other ways of watching it. And so, there's, you know, just a ton of things to think about and do in regard to how to allow people to do what they want to do. So I'm uh, looking at some questions from the audience. Uh, you know, one of our um, students uh, asked a question, why doesn't every team have its own equivalent of a yes network? Anyone want to take that? I'm not going to ask Jerry. If it's, well, it's, it's, easy, it's, yes. easy, it's easy in our case because when we, I mean, all these teams have different unique situations and, and, and in most cases the um, local cable rights, right? Because in, in, in sort of the, in most cases, right, the, in the, the way the U.S. leagues are structured, there's national cable rights and local cable rights. Um, but in the case of the Sixers and the Devils, when we acquired the teams, they had long-term cable deals. And so literally we haven't had an option to do that. But, um, you know, each person would have a different, unique situation. In the NFL, you, we actually are the one league who don't control any of the rights to our regular season or playoff games, and it's all done on a national level. So the games, Jerry, when he created Yes, envisioned that year-round nightly content between the Yankees and the Nets. In the NFL, 
we're not allowed to, to do that. So we've used digital in a lot of ways to create shoulder programming and do other things, but traditional cable television that the Yes Network existed on wasn't possible. And at the Super Bowl this year, we actually did a 24-7 over-the-top streaming network in-house live um, called the Not Done Network. But to do that on a year-round 24-7, 365 basis with the NFL without the games would be very difficult. We just have a few minutes left here. Um, I want to ask each of our panelists uh, to uh, uh, kind of look forward um, you know, to the audience and um, maybe offer one piece of advice that you've been given um, that you'd like to pass along to you know, sort of the future entrepreneurs here uh, who want to start sports-related businesses, invest in sports, or maybe become sports owners like yourselves. Uh, Jonathan, I'll start with you. Um. A lot of times when young people come to see me, their reason for wanting to get into the sports business is that sports is the only thing they love. You know, growing up, I love sports or I love this sport. And I always tell them, um, if you want to get into the sports business, you should really love business also. Marry a love of doing business with that because if you're not a, if you're a great athlete or can be a coach, you can live within the sport. If you're anything else, you better love business and be interested in the, in the principles and disciplines of business, or you're going to end up, in my opinion, not having a very happy, uh, productive professional career. Yeah, Josh? Yeah, I mean, I just say follow your passion. In other words, um, you know, we all spend a lot of time at work. Um, and so if you're really passionate about something, um, you know, you'll spend, you know, uh, you'll spend more time, you'll do better. And so if you're passionate about a particular sport, uh, maybe I'm giving the opposite advice. I'm okay well, jumping in with it. You're uh, smarter than me. <laughs> I'm okay jumping in with it. Um, uh, you know, but what I often tell people is that, um, also that just be careful, you know, you know, my, my path was, you know, I, you know, went to a couple good schools and then you know, worked at a um, branded bank, right? Like, so before I jumped, and then, um, you know, got into business um, at Apollo once we had raised, the, we, we had raised capital, and private equity is a great business. Once you raise the capital, you know, the lights are turned on, you have the management fee. So think about it, th measure twice and cut once in terms of jumping entrepreneurially. Um, and, and so, I, and, and, you know, for every Mark Zuckerberg, there's definitely about 100 people that you've never heard of. And so, Getting, acquiring a skill, um, you know, kind of doing it, pick your, pick your spot. It might be the case that right out of college it makes sense, but it might be the case that, you know, waiting five years or ten years. Last thing I would say is, like, pick a mentor. Um, th these are all apprenticeship businesses, and you, you know, you don't know a lot when you start. Um, and, and so pick someone that you really look up to that can um, take you under their wing and, and show you the ropes, because it's, it's like everything else. Um, you know, it's a system and it'll help you figure it out. Wick? I'd like to talk about raising banners. Uh, the idea of the Celtics was to raise a championship banner, but now that I'm older, um, I thought about things a little bit more. I think we can all raise banners in our lives, and that's sort of one way to live your life. Um, my son is blind, my 25-year-old son, and um, I'm the chairman of Mass Eye and Ear, so we're the world's largest blindness research organization, also the world's largest deafness research organization. And I'd like to raise two more banners in my life. I'd like to mm. have one that says we beat blindness mm -hmm. and one that says we beat deafness. And I think everybody in this room, whether you own a team or not, you can raise banners in your life along those lines, doing something good for the world. And I think it's a thought I'd like to leave you with uh, for the day. Um, and thanks for listening. Jerry? Yeah, two things. Um, yeah. Thanks. Sorry about that, Jerry. No. Over to you. <laughs> uh, two, two simple things I'd say. One is we resist <laughs> the urge to just jump in and start doing before stepping back and asking yourself, why does what you're going to do have a legitimate reason to exist? We live in a world today that's in 30-second sound bites, and what I'm finding is, particularly with young people, is that they just want to jump in and start doing. And I find, particularly in investing, it's tremendous to actually sit back and and try to architect in your own mind what the value chain is and understand what parts of it have a legitimate reason to exist and what parts of it you can jump into and add value to. So that's number one. Second thing is, is you know, if, if you do that, 
um, and you do it objectively, you'll have an opportunity to really, not to use the analogy, but to skate to where the puck's going. And I always find the most, some of the most interesting ways of investing in a content-driven area like sports, where you've got anchored rights properties, is to try to skate to where the puck's going, not necessarily to where it is right now. Great. Well, let's give a round of applause to our uh, all-star panel of investors. Yeah.